Okay, welcome back everybody. I am joined by my friend Ladislas Maurice. We are in Montenegro and we're going to be having a little fireside chat about the country, talk a little bit about the immigration, the taxes, company formation, these types of things. Maybe it makes sense, Ladislas, to kind of explain a little bit about your background in relation to Montenegro. Sure. So I first came here in 2016. A friend of mine from South Africa wanted to come to Europe and she told me, hey, you know, I want to check out Montenegro and I had barely really ever heard of the country. Sure. I knew it was south of Croatia, but I hadn't really thought about it much. So I was like, sure. So we went on a trip for two weeks. And when I first came here, I was like, wow, I just couldn't believe how beautiful the country was. And then within a few days, I went to a real estate agency and I was like, oh, can you show me some property? And I, I thought the prices were very undervalued compared to Croatia nearby. Sure. And so I came back a few months later and bought some property, started operating some flips, and then I've been active here in real estate since uh, essentially since 2016. So that's roughly eight years ago. Have you seen a big development in the country in that eight years or are we pretty much like, does it look the same as it did almost a decade ago? A massive amount of change. Wow. Um, okay. A massive amount of change. There's a huge amount of FTI coming into Montenegro um, from, from really everywhere. Um, so from a developer point of view, there's a lot of luxury developments that are coming to Montenegro, much more so than in Croatia actually because the Montenegrin government is a lot easier to work with when it comes to big, big projects. Okay. So it's a, it's a very administrative and bureaucratic country like most Yugoslav places. But if you come with, if you're a very large investor and you have a vision, uh, there's still a lot of pristine land on the coast and the government will work with you to, to make it happen. So for example, part of Montenegro where we were for a few days in, in Tivat, that was originally money from the Rothschilds and from the former owner of Bear Gold, and then the UAE bought it over, and now they're developing it further. Uh, there's also a very large development called Porto Novi. That's money from Azerbaijan. And then there's another big development called Lushtitsa Bay, and that's Egyptian money. Okay. So it's really money coming from everywhere. And the investors, then people who actually come and, and buy real estate, um, it's a mix of people from from all over. So and it it very it varies from year to year a lot. Um, what you see is there's a regular flow of Arab money coming in, mm -hmm. um, specifically Gulf Arab money going into all the luxury developments. And then when it comes to more retail people, it depends on politics back home. And I think that's that's one of the the, the core insights for for Montenegro is Montenegro has become, surprisingly, because it's in the Balkans and, you know, it has a history of, of the Balkans have a history of volatility, but it's become a refuge of some sorts. Mm -hmm. So right now you have a lot of Russians that are investing here because Russian money is still welcome. Uh, this was going to be my next question was specifically about the Russian money coming yeah. in, because walking around the port area there, you're definitely noticing a lot of Russians and Russian language. So former USSR countries yeah. who are still speaking these types of languages on the street. Um, so I'm not surprised to hear you say that there's a lot of that money coming in too. A lot of, because they, they can't invest in, invest in the West anymore and, sure. and Montenegro is as close as the West as it gets. Um, a lot of Ukrainian money, obviously. A lot of Turkish money as well coming in, uh, but typically more from liberal Turks that don't agree with politics in Turkey. They come to Montenegro. It's easy for them to get residency here mm -hmm. as opposed to the rest of Europe. Uh, there's a lot of Israeli money coming in, especially with the latest issues. Uh, so actually a lot of the Russian speakers you hear, mm -hmm. probably a third of them are actually Israeli. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, Russian Israelis. Um, and a lot of Western money. So. Western money during COVID, there was a lot of Westerners who came here from uh, from North America and from Western Europe because there was more freedom during the whole COVID situation. Um, enforcement, there were rules on paper, but enforcement was quite lax to say the least. So a lot of people came here and then you still have, you know, normal people that come here for uh, just because it's such a beautiful place. But generally speaking, it's a, a kind of neutral jurisdiction 
not entirely neutral because they're part of NATO and they're trying to join the EU, but they're, they're playing all sides. Mm -hmm. I don't know for how long they'll be able to play this game, but it just attracts people that are well, fleeing. Um, as I was saying, I definitely get the Geneva type of vibe, especially with the mountains on the other side of the lake. And this side, it's not the lake, it's the Adriatic. But it, it really does have a lot of that feel. So when you say that it is a neutral place, I think it comes through um, quite a bit because you hear every single language in the world on the streets and just doesn't seem like there's any politicking or people really care. Like everyone's just drinking and smoking cigarettes outside and just eating some fresh fish. And it seemed very like relaxed, I would say. It is. Um, just there's no efficiency like in Switzerland. Okay, <laughs> That's fair. fair enough, fair enough. Well, and the other thing that I wanted to comment on from what you were talking about is the large amounts of money coming in, the foreign direct investment into the into the area. When you're in that port area, you can see that this is not just a couple of entrepreneurs who have gotten together and started building up this area. Like that is a massive development. There's massive infrastructure that have had to go into place. And the restoration of a lot of the buildings, that's not just a couple million dollars. That's hundreds of million dollars, if not more, I would say. I mean, Montenegro attracts billionaires. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what, there's big money coming here. Big, big money. Well, we saw one of the, the, the large yachts. They won the, the yachting uh, super yacht award and things like that. And I think it's owned by the former CEO of Google. And it used to be owned by a Pakistani American billionaire. It was something like 100 meters long. And I, I checked the price tag online. It was $360 million for the yacht. It like... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite exceptional. So, I mean, so I've been coming here for real estate deals, but I also spend a few months per year here in Montenegro. And I have some of my family, some of my relatives, they, they moved to Montenegro and retired. Actually, they came to visit me during COVID. Um, they crashed in my apartment and then they never left. Oh, <laughs> <So>. nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it's, it's beautiful. So from my balcony, I see, you know, $400 million yachts and then I can just walk down and just jump in the, jump in the water, though the water's pretty warm as well in mm -hmm. summer. It's just a, a really, really lovely lifestyle here. Well, I think we were having a coffee or having a beer or something like that. And I was like, it's almost too beautiful here. Like, I wouldn't get any work done. And you're just like, yeah, pretty yeah. much. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to say, when I come to Montenegro, my productivity decreases. Absolutely. <laughs> it was nice waking up in the morning and going straight into the water, just kind of jumping off the pier and getting a swim in first thing. I mean, that was pretty spectacular. And then one of the great things about uh, Montenegro is that it's not just the sea. I mean, right, right here, we're, we're in the mountains. Um, just two and a half hours away from the sea, you can go skiing in, in winter. Um, or hiking. So personally, I went for a hybrid lifestyle here in Montenegro where I have an apartment on the seaside in Tivat. And then I also have a, a house, little farmhouse, more inland, close to the, close to the mountains. And I, I go in between the two. Well, on that note, maybe explain a little bit about where we are um, as we're having this conversation. So right now we are in Kalashin and that is Montenegro's premier ski resort. So again, People need to manage their expectations. It's not the Alps, you know, you're, you're not in Austria, you're not in Switzerland. It's very pretty. Um, people that are expert skiers will probably get bored after a few days. So you just come here for a few days, not, not too long, uh, but it's absolutely lovely. It's very affordable. Um, skiing here is very, very affordable compared to the rest of Europe. Um, a few years back, our prices have gone up since then, but I remember coming to ski here in 20, 18 and paying 10 euros for a day pass. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think when I was started skiing back in the 80s, it was that cheap. So um, that's pretty impressive. But yeah, it's actually, it's quite cool up here now in the mountains, but it's like midsummer. Like we were getting up to probably 38, 40 degrees weather yesterday when we were on the coastline. Um, I'm certainly glad that I brought a jacket with me up into the mountains, but we're staying at the Swiss Hotel, which is a brand new resort here. Um, absolutely gorgeous. I can't wait to actually come back to this area and hopefully stay at that same place. They had the little two bedroom apartments that we were renting with a kitchenette and a balcony and everything. And I felt like I was back in Banff or Lake Louise when I lived in the ski resorts in 2002, you know, like it's just it transported me back to Canada. So it was pretty spectacular. 
So you mentioned you've had some family who have come and visited and they've now kind of made Montenegro their home. Maybe talk us through a little bit about the visa situation and what that looks like in the country. Yeah, so that's that's a good question. So there are two main ways that people can obtain residency here in Montenegro. The first one is by buying real estate. Okay. So essentially, if you own real estate in Montenegro, this gives you the right to apply for residency. And you can become a resident this way. Um, you get a one-year residency that you can renew indefinitely as long as you keep the property. Sure, maintain the maintain exactly. the property. Okay. Now, it's not a plan B residency in the sense that when you get the residency through real estate, they expect you to stay in the country at least 10 to 11 months per year. Okay, so it's really a relocation type of play. Yeah. So it's more of a plan A. You can have the property as a plan B in the sense that it's it's a call option on a residency. So okay. that's what a lot of people did when the war started between Russia and Ukraine. There's suddenly a, a flood of Russians and Ukrainian who came here escaping the war and the draft. They had property here and they were able to just apply for their residency and boom, they were living here legally. So it's a plan B in that sense, but you won't have an active residency card you know when you if you're not actually living here the, the whole time you can and then come back every year and apply from year one again but okay. you won't be working towards permanent residency and it's more paperwork each time but that's also a possibility people that people could do and for the real estate investment did you mention a dollar amount that needs to be spent or is it just a property a property okay um, it just needs to be you know credible you can't buy some hut and try to put 10 people in there sure uh, there's an informal rule informal it's not written anywhere uh, that there should be at least 18 square meters per person applying okay that's it and with this uh, residency, you said that it can lead to a permanent residency. What's that look like, the timeline, time um, horizon? You, it's really tough to get permanent residency. Mm. You need to spend five years in Montenegro, of which you cannot be gone for more than nine months during the whole time, right? So very few people wow. actually get permanent residency in Montenegro. There's also a language test, which varies depending on whether they like you or not so it's it's quite subjective also some people from some countries can, can buy real estate mm -hmm. and you know so if you're i'll just give an example if you're from pakistan and you buy a, a small apartment and you try to come here with your family your residency will probably get declined so there's just a preference, informal preference for some countries, just sure. as you see, I mean, in Latin America, you deal with that a lot. There's a lot of that going on as, as well in Latin America. Same thing here. Um, the second way to obtain residency here is just to create a company. Okay. Um, you open a company, you hire yourself as the director, you pay yourself a the minimum wage, you pay a little bit of taxes, a little bit of social security taxes. Ballpark, what would be a minimum wage in this country? Uh, it keeps going up. The minimum wage has gone up, uh, has done a 2x in the last three years, mm -hmm. um, which is why there's so much inflation in Montenegro and construction costs are up so much. Um, but you're looking at, with the latest increase that's going to come in the next few months, between 700 and 1,000 euros minimum wage, depending on the, the type of qualification and the type of role. Okay, so you pay yourself a nominal salary around a thousand euros, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit yeah. less, depending on how many dependents you have, and pay a little bit of taxes on that, yeah. and maybe yeah. some social security or something. And that's it. It comes with free healthcare. Okay, uh, which is half decent, honestly. It's not too bad. It's all in Montenegrin, um, so you know you can just go with a translator, and you know you'll be fine. Uh, or you can just use private healthcare. To keep the company active, you can just book a few you know, consulting calls, let's put it this way, so that the, the company actually has a little bit of activity. Yep, some movement um, of the money. And and yep. there, the it's a lot more flexible. So there's no real rules in terms of how long you have to be in Montenegro to keep the company active. Okay. But the general understanding, again, like when you're in Montenegro, when it comes to taxes and immigration, there's what's written. Uh, which is often not a lot. And then there's what's happening in practice, which is ambiguous and which evolves over time, which again, you know, <laughs> you do a lot of business in Latin America, you understand that. 
Um, well, so. it is always funny working with North Americans or Western Europeans who are like so used to everything being really fleshed out, really black yeah. and white. And it's like, yeah, the rest of the world is a little bit more yeah. chilled out when it comes to these types of things. <laughs> exactly. So for the residency by company formation, you get residency. Generally, they expect you to spend at least half the year okay. in the country. Uh, then you can get your... Is this like the 183 days become a tax resident type of thing or just it, like a... It makes you a tax resident. Yeah. Okay. Like generally speaking, they expect you to be a tax resident if you have a company. Okay. Right. So even if you're not, um, but if you spend less than 183 days, they won't give you a tax certificate, mm -hmm. but they'll still consider you a tax resident. Okay. So again, ambiguity and you need to navigate that. So from a plan B perspective, again, it's not great. Montenegro is more of a plan A. Okay. Um, but then again, you know, it's a nice plan A. It's not a, it's not a problem to be here. Sure. So there you just need to spend at least half the year. Um, you can bring your kids, underage kids, your spouse, just like the other one on, on the, on the family reunification. Mm -hmm. um, they're stricter on the family reunification when it comes to the amount of time spent in the country. Okay. Um, so the spouse, for example, is expected to spend 10 months a year. But the enforcement is also quite lax when it's a when it's through the company formation. So there's a little bit of ambiguity, but you know you just renew it annually, and generally it's fine. I haven't had clients that really had any major problems renewing okay. uh, their residency permits at all. And if you're if you're North American, if you're from Australia, New Zealand, you know the UK, Western Europe, they make it easy for for people like that to to move. If you're you know, Turkish, you know, Russian, a little tougher, but still doable. If you come from a country that requires you to have a visa for Montenegro, forget about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, walk us through the tax situation. I understand it's more lax, but let's, let's just kind of go through a ballpark of the official numbers for the tax side. Cool. All right. So this is not tax advice, uh, but generally speaking for corporations, it's between 9 and 15% corporate income tax, mm -hmm. which is low by international standards. Mm -hmm. However, what isn't discussed much is the dividend tax is quite high mm. at 15%. Okay. So once you add the two together, it's not nothing, but um, you can deduct a lot. Okay. So, you know, you can... You so can, basically what, what you're saying is corporation makes money, you're going to be paying whatever it was, 15 to 19 percent or 20 percent or something like that. And then yeah. as soon as you go to pull the money out, you're going to get whacked with another 15. 9 to 15. 9 to 15. Sorry. Yep. So essentially corporate income tax, 9 to 15 percent plus a dividend tax rate of 15 percent. But in running your business, you can put a lot of expenses through. Okay. So you know, that's it's it's OK from that point of view. Um, what people need to understand is that, again, Montenegro is not a good base for a business to do international business. Banking here is absolutely atrocious. Um, <laughs> okay. If you, do, you know, it's just terrible banking. Um, and you don't have access to any credible payment processors, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so, so just, no Stripe, no PayPal, no the, these types of PayPal's merchant on its accounts way, and stuff. But it's just, it's just not a good place to, to, to have an actual international business. Mm -hmm. um, from the personal from a personal tax point of view, you're looking at roughly 15%, generally speaking, in, in most cases, 15% um, taxes, um, dividend, 15%, capital gains, 15%. Okay. So it's not a zero tax jurisdiction, but for European standards, it's pretty low tax. What about property taxes? What does that look like? Uh, whatever, a few hundred euros <laughs> per year. Uh, it's just whatever. It's, it's one of those questions that come up with Americans because, yeah. you know, it's very easy to spend twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars a year on property taxes. Like yeah. you really have to count that in when you're doing these types of investments. Yeah, no, that's not a like property tax is just not a, a is not material here. Okay, talk us through property ownership. Are these title deed properties? Is this freehold? Is this leasehold? What does that look like? So it's all freehold. Um, property rights are really strong in Montenegro, so I'm not worried at all when I make purchases here. However, you really need to hire a lawyer because a lot of the title deeds are a little dirty. Sure. They can have claims. Um, sometimes the people selling it are not the ones that actually own it, or there's a family that inherited the thing and there are 16%, 16 people on it, and only 15 have signed you know, the, to, to sell it. So you really need to look into it. 
And then there's also an issue with legalization. So close to 30% of properties in Montenegro have not been legalized. Uh, so people just had a plot of land and built a house. It hasn't been legalized. It's not, it's not a train smash mm -hmm. um, in most cases, but it really depends on which municipalities, uh, did they do it before amnesties or after amnesties, et cetera. So you really need a, a local uh, lawyer to, to guide you through the process. Personally, I, I don't have an issue buying properties that are not fully legalized. Mm -hmm. I've, I've done this before, then you have to go through a process. But again, it depends on the municipality and exactly what hasn't been legalized and when was the structure built, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you see a property that hasn't been legalized, again, just get a good lawyer, understand the implications. There are going to be fees to legalize the property, um, but just make sure that you don't buy property that is not legalized, that cannot be legalized, because uh, that also happens. People just trust a real estate agent. They go without a without a lawyer. They sign something at the notary public and then... Makes sense. You know. What about the holding of the real estate? Is it traditionally done in your own name, a local structure, a foreign structure, trusts, foundations? Walk us through the property ownership side of things. So before there were tax incentives for people to use local structures to buy real estate, those are all gone. So most people just buy in their own name. Okay. Um, if you're going to be trying to operate through a Panama Foundation, etc., um, sure, you could create a local corporation. You could have problems with banking. There are one or two banks which might take you, but then which might kick you out a year later, mm -hmm. and then you'd end up with this without a... So it's... You really need to, to be careful. Um, the issue is not really the, the structures per se. It's the banking that'll come with the structures. Because again, sense. banking here is terrible. <laughs> makes sense, makes sense. Uh, what about the local scene for Airbnb? Is it possible to use short-term rental platforms like that? Because I know that around the world, a lot of cities are really pushing back against these types of things. Um, a lot of lobbyists from the hotel industry coming in. And when you look at an area like the port where, where we were, I mean, there's just gorgeous hotels there. How, how is the, the, the scene if you want to come in on the short-term rentals? No real restrictions. Uh, tourism represents about 30% of GDP here. Um, everyone's involved in tourism, local workers, etc. So their real estate is a massive business. So there are no restrictions in terms of uh, in terms of Airbnb. You have to register and pay some taxes, but that's pretty much it. Okay. And how do the locals feel about so many tourists coming in? Not just the, the day tourists on the cruise ships or people coming from a vacation, but people like us, like expats coming into the country for six months or nine months a year. It's it's not a shock to them okay. uh, because even during Yugoslavian times, people just come to Montenegro as a tourism destination. Um, they understand that their country is just dependent on tourism. So, you know, there's no animosity or anything. Um, people here aren't, you know, friendly in the, in the, you know, Thai or Colombian kind of way where it's like smiles and, you know, all polite. People are pretty direct here. Um, for specifically for North Americans, people here can come across as a little rude. Uh, but it's not that they're being rude. It's just that, you know, whatever. They don't really care. Um, they're yeah. not anti you. They just don't really care. Yeah. But, well, it, but here in more rural areas, people are super friendly. Um, but on the coast, you know, there's mass tourism. So it's just people just don't care. It is a little bit to get used to. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would agree with your sentiment that they're not purposefully trying to be rude. But if you come from a culture that has a lot of flowery language in it and please and if you don't mind and all these types of things, the directness can startle you sometimes, I would say. Yeah, for sure. I personally, I like it. I find that it's part of the charm. Yeah. Because like people don't care here. They just don't care. And that's important. Because you, there are a lot of countries you move to, a lot in Latin America, where your neighbors are always getting involved and you're doing something and they're not happy. And, sure. I mean, in Latin America, people, especially in the nicer neighborhoods in Latin America, um, neighbors are can can be really really problematic. They There's really, a lot of busybodies for they sure. Get involved in your business, and here they just don't care. They mm -hmm. don't care. <laughs> so that comes with pros and cons. No, it is pretty funny. Um, and my earlier comment also goes back to because a lot of 
you know, expat hotspot type of countries are starting to get a lot of backlash for so much foreign direct investment, for so many expats coming into the country. If you look at a place like Portugal or even in Spain, there's now, you know, the governments are kind of blaming foreigners for the, the rise in um, housing prices and things like that, where now it's mainstream media that, you know, the, the expats are the problem, where it's like, well, you know, a rise, in my opinion, a rising tide lifts all boats and it increases a lot of the, the, the service industry and a lot of money goes into fixing up older places, you know, creating jobs for uh, plumbers and electricians and all these types of things. So understanding the sentiment by the local people and if you are welcome in that country, I think is important. Yeah. Um, look, it's a tiny country of 600,000 people. Is that all it is? Yeah, it's just like, it's like a small city. And how many tourists do they get a year? Any idea? Uh, I forgot. It's got to be tens of, like... Yeah, more than the population, for sure. Well, it's got to yeah, be like yeah. tens of millions, I would imagine. It's, it's yeah, significantly more than the population, that's for sure. So, I mean... No I was in North Cyprus last week, and their tourism was 7 million people last year. And there's all, like almost no development in the country whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's very barren. And you look at this, and it is really fleshed out. Like they really know what they're doing from a tourism standpoint. We had four cruise ships arrive in one day, yeah. and I mean massive. There must have been two thousand people on the cruise ship. If there's going to be a victim of mass tourism in the next few years, it'll be the cruise ships. Because yeah. if anything, the the locals are getting a little upset at the cruise ships specifically. Uh, yeah, specifically, but not not tourism in, in general. Okay, amazing. Uh, anything that you think that is important that we didn't touch on in our conversation today that people should know if they're thinking about spending time in Montenegro or investing in Montenegro? So from an Anglo world point of view, Montenegro is probably the, the easiest or one of the easiest countries to move to in Europe uh, because it's not in Schengen, it's not in the European Union, you don't have to deal with complicated paperwork to move into Spain or Portugal or this or that. Um, you literally just come here with your apostile, apostile birth certificate, um, criminal background check, uh, you know, 1500 euros, create the company, boom, you have residency. Uh, so, so it's, it's really interesting from that point of view. If you want to live in Europe, you don't want to deal with much paperwork, you want a low tax environment, you can just base yourself here and then travel around and go to the Schengen area, all of that. So people, a lot of people do this, Australians, New Zealanders, Americans. They live here for six months of the year, they do the company formation, and then they take the, their two inter international airports in Montenegro. I have to say the, it's a small country, so the connections aren't fantastic, mm -hmm. but it's good enough for Europe. Uh, and you can fly to you can fly to London, you can fly to Paris, you can fly to. Budapest, we came in through uh, Istanbul, Istanbul, and it was like yeah. very very fast. And I think the drive from there to my hotel on the coast was like six minutes, nine minutes, ten minutes, something like this. It was so fast. I walked to the airport. <laughs> I walked to the airport. I don't know anywhere else in the world where you yeah. can literally walk to the airport. I, I walk to the airport and then take an international flight to Istanbul. That's so funny. That's, I mean, that's, that's a pretty nice lifestyle. No I, I could take a five euro cab, but I just, I just love the concept of walking to the airport. So yeah, so essentially it's a great solution for people who want the European lifestyle without all the, the EU bureaucracy and who want freedom. Amazing. Ladislas, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Good to talk to you. See you in another country. This has got to be 10 countries we've seen each other in the last couple of years. So always a pleasure. Thank you.